with us today Steve Greeny from Joint Venture Silicon Valley, my far left. Joel Ramis from Transform to speak to our social equity. And Adam Stalker from the University of California at Berkeley Transportation Sustainability Research Center. So if you leave, if you want to be an informed voter, you have to take a Lyft or Uber. Get a friend and give you a trip on it because it's, it's a, a, a very interesting phenomenon. And think about it compared to a taxi experience. Um, it eliminates waiting under conditions of uncertainty. It tends to drive humans crazy. So it's a better user experience. Um, and the more advanced flavor of Lyft and Uber is Lyft Line and Uber Pool, which increases the occupancy inside a vehicle so it's more efficient and better for the environment. And because two strangers are riding in the Lyft vehicle, then uh, it's a lower cost, takes a little more time to get where you're going. Um, but there's enough scale of people in San Francisco to make it really successful because there are tons of people essentially going the same direction form an ad hoc carpool. Now, for mobility as a service in Europe, it's going bonkers, and the first four bullets there are German entities. They're really in the lead on mobility as a service, and uh, Daimler Mercedes, the purple bullet there, uh, they have this vision to become the Google of mobility, so very uh, ambitious. And Los Angeles just launched a new service that gets them partway along the way, so that was pretty innovative. Well, and what is mobility as a service? What coming up to it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Come on, and um, in urban places, like San Francisco, where it costs you twenty dollars a day to park, and where Lyft lines got enough scale to work, this is the kind of good place for mobility as a service. Um, so we think of this seamless meeting together of public and private transit, any option you can think of besides driving alone, as part of the mobility as a service solution. Uh, there's about five or six different vendors that provide great solutions for that. So we think of this working great in San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley. Um, and it's a trip planning app that gives you a bunch of options on your smartphone and um, does a great job of knitting together two or three modes in a single trip to get you where you want to go. Um, there's a notion that you might give up a car and pay 400 bucks a month to get a basket of mobility to get where you need to go. Um, and so it's knitting together public transit, private transit, car share, bike share, electric scooter, Uber pool, karma carpooling, anything you can think of. And so the notion is two to one millennials none. So a two car family could sell one car and then use your smartphone to get around and millennials would never need to buy a car. Um, so the drive less, are you skeptical? <laughs> potential to provide great mobility, improved mobility to low-income folks, but I think we're going to need to figure out how to come up with a subsidy for that to make that work. And great mobility options available for seniors and teens with this as well. Um, so that's the urban flavor of mobility as a service. And now let's, you know, most of the area is auto-centered, like right here in San Pablo or uh, Silicon Valley. And this table here is a comparison against Helsinki, which is transit-centered, versus uh, Silicon Valley. And in nine different dimensions, Helsinki is so much better for mobility than Silicon Valley. So transit ridership is 12 times as high. There's four times as much biking. There's half as much driving alone, SOV. Um, it costs, costs to park. It costs a lot more to buy a car. It's a lot more dense, and so on and so forth. And that's a quote from Maria Fernandez, the new general manager of VTA, saying, you know, it's insane that we don't charge for parking in Silicon Valley because she came from New York City. <laughs> you go, there you go. So, when we talk about uh, <coughs> reducing commuting in suburbia, we don't really have a policy template. So, nowhere in the U.S. for a big chunk of suburbanites have we ever shifted commute mode from 75% drive alone down to 70%. So, we've never tried to do this before, but I'm arguing that we have this perfect storm because traffic congestion is so bad, we have climate imperatives, we've got great new software, we've got some innovations in policy where I say we can get down to 50% SOB, so a real transformation of suburbia. And Joint Ventures' mission is to help accelerate that transformation. So, have you heard about California Transportation Plan 2040? 
alternative three is the super green pro-climate one. Um, no other state has anything like this. It's kind of amazing. So checks the climate, you know, down to sort of Kyoto levels, um, reduces congestion, um, increases adoption of electric vehicles, but also calls for reducing per capita driving by 17%, which is a pretty radical thing to propose. Um, the HOV diamond lanes that allow two or three people in, that goes up to four people. So a four person diamond lane ends up carrying the same number of people as the three lanes adjacent to it. So it's super efficient. Transit biking double, yay. Um, they stop building road, road expansions. And uh, MTC at the regional level has a similar sort of goal. Okay, so those are great objectives, but what's the policy solution for that? And this is non-trivial, right? So the policy solution is if you think of your kid who doesn't like to eat spinach, then they need to eat their spinach because it's good for them, right? And so in a sort of a, in a rational pro-climate world, we would increase the gas tax by five bucks a gallon so we get up to Helsinki gas prices. Okay, there's no chance of doing that's not viable. Um, also in a rational pro-climate world, uh, Jerry Brown and Tom Steyer would bring forth a pay-as-you-drive auto insurance ballot initiative, which would reduce driving by about 8% per capita. Um, and that's semi-viable. It's not an easy thing, but you know, it would be nice if that advanced. And then um, another thing we think is somewhat politically viable is doing what Stanford does for trip reduction, which is coming up in the next slide. Uh, but it's not easy from a policy standpoint, right? Um, so some of the Silicon Valley tech employers have an expensive way to do commute reduction, but it doesn't scale because most of the private sector companies don't want to spend a ton of money on their employee commuting. So sometimes Google might be spending 6,000 bucks per year to run the Google Bus per employee. They're pretty expensive. And so what like Stanford and Berkeley do is they combine carrots and sticks in an innovative way. So Stanford charges three bucks a day to park, they take that revenue and they give it to the next person to bike or carpool or what have you. Um, and they shifted mode way down with that sort of solution and they saved building a lot of parking structures. So we think that something like that is moderately politically viable and would really scale. And in Silicon Valley, we're having what's called trip caps which is a real public policy innovation. So if you're Apple and you want to build that new donut-shaped campus, or if you're Facebook and you want to build that new campus, in exchange for your development rights, you agree to a super low drive-alone commute rate for your employees. So those trip caps are really innovative. And it started back in 1989 with uh, Stanford um, getting that imposed on them. And so th there's real teeth in the Facebook one. It's really expensive if they go over their cap of trips. And there's great new software that allows an employer to track how the employees are commuting. So they know how many people are driving alone and parking, how many people are biking, how many people are taking transit. And so you get this real-time commute dashboard so you can see how you're doing. And when you get close to the cap, you realize you've got to sort of crank up your commute program. Uh, and there's three vendors that are providing this software. It's just coming out. It's really exciting. And one of the key bits of technology in this, if you're an employee, is this commute calendar that you face. And so on Monday, if you biked, you, you drag that icon into your calendar. On Tuesday, if you took transit, you drag that in. And on Wednesday, if you drove, you drag that in. And that may actually raise or lower your paycheck a little bit, depending upon what carrots and sticks are implemented. Um, and then people look at this and they say, well, we don't really want our employees spending 60 seconds per week filling this out. And so I think a key part is to automate that, and to figure out what mode people took. And so I'll close on my last slide with saying there's so much innovation going on right now for people's mobility with electric bikes that are lowering the, lowering the cost to like 1500 bucks a bike, electric scooters that could be your first or last mile to the train, um, lift driver destination, cherry bridge, you name it. So thank you. So again, what I was talking about was the urban mobility as a service and the suburban commute reduction that's then could transform into mobility as a service. I have nothing but the utmost respect for, uh, for the league. 
Um, you folks have been there in so many different um, capacities with Transform's work in the past, and uh, we really see all of you and all of your important, important commitment and dedication to this work uh, as a fundamental part of uh, getting to where we need to be. Um, if you're not familiar with Transform, uh, we're a nonprofit organization that advocates for better transit opportunities for everyone. We're advocating all the time for more uh, walkable, livable, sustainable, economically thriving communities uh, that where we can all afford to live in, especially if we're going to be working there. Richard, nice, uh, nice point on that earlier. Um, we do this by working with uh, community-based organizations, local stakeholders on so many different um, areas and projects, and working with them to help inform decision makers, key policy makers, whether they're staff like uh, Tesla and Jiao, who was up here earlier, or um, elected officials um, that are making um, important policy decisions on behalf of all of us. And I think we've even got a few elected officials in the room today, and I want to make sure that we call them out. Um, I see um, our, our wonderful BART director, Robert Rayburn here. Um, director Rayburn, if you could uh, raise your hand. He's, he's a wonderful leader. We're lucky to have him. <laughs> uh, director uh, at large, Chris Peoples here from AC Transit is another one that is really important to have. Uh, and we've got, who else here? I'm Cecilia Valdez. I'm vice mayor of San Pablo, but I'm also on the Big Tech board. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Any other electeds? Uh, former electeds. I see, did I see Vim Holly in here earlier? There she is. My, one of my best friends in the outcome coming out of Berkeley. We can't do this work without all of you. Anyone else? Any other directors? <laughs> Director Zachary Malay. Another, uh, I'm sorry? Chris And yeah, just saw Chris people. Um, but uh, folks like this, you know, uh, and I'm Pradeep Gupta, Vice Mayor of South San Francisco, and Eva Thank you all for being here and making the time. Thank you all for the City of South San Francisco Council and Sam Trans. Wonderful. Yes, all, all wonderful folks that we need to work on. Folks want to know what's happening with high speed rail. We need to get Caltrans, uh, Caltrain, and the electrification process integrated. To, to be able to get high-speed rail up here sooner than later. So that's something that's keeping us from uh, moving along as quickly as we need to, to be uh, up there. But I'm sure we can talk more about that. Um, uh, Transform has been, has been put in a unique position of having worked with particularly underrepresented communities and making sure that transit benefits uh, really improve their experience of riding transit um, themselves. I myself got my start working in East Oakland in the Fruitvale, working around the, the uh, Fruitvale Transit Village out there that we have now. Uh, many years ago, it was just a bunch of parking lots and dilapidated buildings, and it's an incredible place now. Wasn't you know? Uh, it was something, an idea that came around before the concept transit-oriented development even really was uh, the, the, the term of of art. Uh, we then, uh, I then moved on to do other things and then started to work on bus rapid transit, or BRT, which is what um, Tesla and Jell was talking about earlier, helping to get um, community stakeholders engaged and informed about that particular project that's going to really dramatically improve transit um, as it runs the 1 and the 1R line, as it runs from San Leandro up into downtown Oakland. It was originally supposed to go through San Leandro all the way up through to Berkeley, to uh, UC Berkeley, um, but um, Berkeley wouldn't have it. Um, so we, uh, we, we tried, though, didn't we, Ben? We tried so hard. Um, and so because I was doing that, and Transform was doing that, helping people, communities that, you know, for who this thing was going to be running across their front porches, understand how transit-only lanes would be good for them, and how proof of payment would be good for them, and how better parking management would be good for our communities. These are all things that are innovative and technology-effectively driven. Um, you can't really, uh, the, all, the, all the wonderful um, things that we're making, the progress that we're making in terms of getting better data about our transit still needs to make its way into um, communities that have been left behind um, uh, in too many conversations around this, these things. Um, Transform has been working uh, lately under uh, a grant that we just won um, from an organization called Just Transit. And we're, we're going to be working with them uh, and an app provider, a transit app provider called Ride Scout. If you've got a phone and you're using apps, transit apps, I really recommend you checking out Ride Scout. It's a wonderful app that's going to show you wherever you are um, what your uh, mobility options are. Um, the challenge, of course, is, is that um, a lot of underrepresented communities um, that 
that really haven't moved over to using app technology yet um, are going to need a little bit of uh, uh, support in getting access into these um, to using these apps. And we hope to be able to work with them on on getting um, them to use Ride Scout. And in that way, all the information that you see on the little next bus terminals that are that AC Transit has such a hard time keeping up. Um, with cities and, and everyone else um, involved in, in that technology, it's all on your phone. And not only that, but you get to see you know things like the the town uh, the the, uh, the transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft. You also thankfully now in San Francisco they have Flywheel, which is an app based taxi um, app. So you can now see the taxis where they are and where you know if it's coming or not. Um, it's another wonderful app. Um, the problem with these things, of course, is that they're not driven, they're profit driven. They don't have a real incentive to make the extra effort to get folks that typically aren't a part of these conversations to the table and using these services. Um, I'll give you the bike share program, Mother Bates bike share program as an example. Um, you know, they're not gonna be really excited about the idea of pushing bike share pods out into neighborhoods that are unbanked or are really far from, uh, from transit opportunities like big transit junk, uh, places, transit hubs, where they would get a whole lot of uh, traditional users. So we're gonna be working, hopefully, working more closely with bike share, or even the same thing can be said about car share opportunities. All of these things are, are services that we need to make sure are including underrepresented communities. And when I mean underrepresented communities, I don't mean just low-income communities, because low-income communities are absolutely critical. We need to make sure that they're included. But we also mean people who don't speak English as their first language. We're talking about people that are uh, mobility impaired or disabled, that are having a hard time getting around and often don't get the kind of uh, support that they need. Um, underrepresented communities can be anyone who's having a hard time accessing services in whatever capacity um, uh, that, that that might entail. Um, a lot of our work stems from helping public agencies and the private sector get more um, get more access to community groups that uh, that they haven't reached out to in the past. So a lot of the way that we've been able to achieve um, this work is by working with the fantastic community-based organizations like the Spanish Speaking Community Council or APEN, the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, or Poder in San Francisco, which has done a phenomenal job of reaching out to um, immigrant um, communities and working with them on helping to better understand and uh, uh, operate bicycling in the city, getting around by bicycle, and um, putting together programs that will help build support for what is clearly a need uh, to, to get uh, more people out of cars and, um, and to reduce uh, traffic as well. Um, we are certainly very concerned and are interested in making sure that the driverless vehicle phenomenon that I'm sure somebody's going to be talking about um, sooner or later is, is one that's equitable as well. Um, we want to make sure that, that people are spoken to and communities are talked um, to and, work, and, uh, and uh, we're all working together on making sure that these driverless vehicles or these TNCs aren't creating traffic jams um, when these things are just driving around waiting to be called up again or uh, the TNCs, the Uber and the Lyfts aren't just driving around waiting to, to get a call. Um, these are getting in the way of buses, uh, the, the stuff that in transit. And even if you're another driver that's in your own car, I'm sure if you're in San Francisco, you've been stopped, you know, these lifts and Ubers and what have you, they get in your way as they're double parking to pick up passengers or find where they are. So Transform is in this unique position to have been able to work with these tech firms that are profit-driven mostly, um, and make sure that they do their job, they do their due diligence to, to get their product into the hands of everyone by way of maybe it's subsidies, maybe it's better, deeper, more um, outreach that's sensitive to a community need, um, having meetings that are in local destinations that provide childcare, that um, might provide transportation that's more than just a parking voucher, um, bus passes and things of that nature. So I'm happy to talk more on that angle. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Are today, um, and this is a little bit out of our wheelhouse. We're mainly we study at our center the shared mobility side of things. So things like 
been mentioning a lot so far, car sharing, bike sharing, these TNC services like, like Uber and Lyft, but um, I'm gonna kind of move into what the highway in the future might look like, um, and specifically what some of the vehicle technologies might look like in the future. So um, just a short overview, I'm gonna talk about um, automated vehicles. So this is you know, self-driving vehicles, uh, the Google car is an example of this. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about connected vehicles. These are vehicles that can talk to both themselves and to um, you know, their, their environment. Um, then I'm gonna talk about potential impacts of this and, and wrap up with uh, sort of the mobility as a service um, that Steve had been talking about. Uh, so automated vehicles. So what are, what are automated vehicles? You guys have probably heard a lot um, in the news about this. This is the Google car, so essentially. Um, a car that can, you know, is self-driving, that can, uh, you know, with minimal human, human input can drive you from point A to point B. Um, and uh, NHTSA defines four levels of vehicle automation, um, from level zero being no vehicle automation to level four being pretty much full automation with almost the only manual input by the user being either a destination or a route, um, but other than that, it does all the work for you. Um, and so obviously, there are a lot of major technology companies and uh, major, um, major, uh, uh, big um, uh, uh, um, auto, uh, auto manufacturers, sorry, um, really pursuing this technology. So Google is a huge one. Um, they're probably out in front right now with their uh, Google self-driving car, but every single auto manufacturer is pursuing this as well. So uh, Ford, GM, um, Tesla obviously released their level two um, autopilot in the last couple months that um, allows you to have both lane keeping and adaptive cruise control for highway crews. So a lot of this is coming, and it's coming pretty fast. Um, and just to, just to show you some, kind of some of the sensory systems that are on this, um, so the different companies kind of take their own different approaches to what slew of technology they have on their vehicles, but it's any combination of LiDAR, radar, um, advanced cam camera systems, and lane keeping systems. Um, so I was going to show a video, but I think that might go over. So I'm going to skip here into connected vehicles. So connected vehicles, um, a lot of people don't, you know, with, with the whole automated vehicles getting 90% of the air time um, on, you know, big news media sources, a lot of people kind of skip over the connected vehicles portion of this. So a connected vehicle is a vehicle that's able to communicate wirelessly um, among each other and among uh, its surroundings. So there's um, this is, you know, so uh, one thing to note is that a connected vehicle does not necessarily have to be automated. Um, and connected vehicle technology is largely here today. Um, it's, not, it's not deployed on a, wide, on a very large public scale yet, um, but the technology is much more ready than the automated vehicle technology, no doubt. Um, so there are kind of two main um, components of connected vehicle technology. There's B2B technology, so vehicle to vehicle technology. My car can talk to your car. If your car senses an accident down the road, it can inform my car of this to better navigate. Um, and then there's B to I technology, which is vehicle to, to, the, to, the, to the infrastructure um, technology. So this is my vehicle can talk to the street signal and let it know my position to better manage the flow of traffic through that, through that arterial. Um, but one, one really important part of connected vehicle technology is who, who manages the rules. So if I can, if my car can talk to the street light that's probably ran by the city, let's say, um, you know, who is, who is managing what cars get priority? So let's say uh, there's a connected bus with 50 people on one side of an intersection, and there's 10 single occupant vehicles on the other side that are all connected. You know, is there some sort of transit signal priority? I think someone on the last panel had mentioned that, um, or some sort of, uh, you know, person-based priority that, that gives uh, priority to, you know, the, 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 the vehicle with the, with the highest, with the highest uh, number of people in it. Um, so these are all rules that are gonna need to really, you know, come together and require a big public and private, um, you know, effort to kind of, um, uh, you know, integrate the best, uh, the best practices here. Um, and obviously data, data sharing and data privacy is a huge issue um, with any of this. If there are private companies that have proprietary data that, um, and also users that have data that is you know, personal to them, they're gonna have to be rules that are uh, implemented by cities um, to really kind of get, 
get the efficiency gains that we can that we can get with this technology. But those are all those these things are all yet to be seen how they'll play out, obviously. Um, and then just one note, you know, I mentioned that connected vehicles don't need to be automated. Um, you know, that technology is here now. You could have this wireless respondent in your car as it exists now. Um, but mo most people are guessing that automated vehicles will be connected. But one thing to note is as of right now, they aren't necessarily. So Google right now is developing its automated technology without a lot of connected components. So they're, they're more going for the moonshot of they drop, you know, a vehicle in its environment and it can navigate around itself um, as a silo. It, it can, it can you know, sense its own environment. So it doesn't necessarily, they're not necessarily developing that yet, but likely will. Um, so what, is, what does all this have to do with you know, how, how it's gonna affect you, right? Any of these new vehicle technologies, everyone wants to know, oh, so I'm not gonna be sitting in traffic anymore, right? Uh, you might, you might still be sitting in traffic. So there's, you know, and especially at first, um, you know, the way that these vehicles will roll out will obviously be gradual, no doubt, and will be integrated with our existing non-automated and potentially non-connected vehicle fleet. Um, you know, the market penetration levels of which we will be largely place dependent. Um, but, uh, you know, and one, one thing is with, with any advancement in, in transportation technology, um, there's almost always this this sort of um, this sort of uh, uh, induced demand effect, where you know, and, and automated vehicles. And Steve was nice enough to share um, some information with me. Uh, you know, there have been multiple studies done that are predicting that automated vehicles will, in fact, increase uh, increase vehicle miles traveled, um, simply because they're you know a faster, more convenient, uh, more comfortable, you know potentially cheaper if we're talking about mobility as a service in some cases, uh, mode of transportation, and any mode of transportation that is quote unquote better um, almost always has this induced demand effect. Um, so are you still gonna be sitting in traffic? Probably at first, um, but one of the really the kind of pie in the sky goals um, that vehicle automation brings is when we really combine it with shared mobility. So sort of moving into, especially what Steve was mentioning, um, the whole, the whole uh, uh, you know, MOS um, system. So, um, you know, this is this is really where, and this is also where our research comes into play regarding shared mobility. Um, you know, if you can combine shared mobility and the vehicle automation side of things, um, you know, you really have the potential to reduce the you know single occupant vehicles, which is which makes up so many of our trips right now in the U.S. Um, but it, it is hard to predict these things. It's really hard to predict, um, you know, the business model business models, how, you know, what these vehicles might look like. Um, but most of all, it's, a, it's incredibly hard to predict, you know, how we're going to behave around these systems. So modeling these systems is incredibly hard to predict right now. And as humans, we're terrible at predicting things, as you guys probably know. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, this, this whole, this whole, you know, uh, MOS um, concept is really gaining steam. Um, and, you know, I, Steve, covered for me nicely, you know, Lyft and Uber, and especially their, their carpooling features, Lyft Line. Um, and, you know, these, these things are, are really gaining a lot of traction, um, especially among people, you know, in, in my generation, in, in dense urban areas, especially in San Francisco, um, and other big cities in the US. Um, and there have been a lot of recent business deals as of late that are really pointing toward kind of this, this combination of shared mobility and, and vehicle automation. So GM uh, just invested half a billion dollars into Lyft um, recently in the last month. Um, Ford has partnered with Google on their self-driving car project. Uber bought basically Carnegie Mellon's robotics department um, to build them a self-driving car. Uh, and and even, even like more legacy shared mobility companies like Zipcar have you know, teamed with uh, I think the University of Michigan's, you know, self-driving car efforts. So there's a lot of there's a lot of signs that are pointing kind of toward the the combination of shared mobility and vehicle automation. How this will look? Will we all be sitting in traffic still? Who knows, right? But probably we will still for a while. Um, so last, just a little conclusion. Uh, you know, automated vehicles will have what a large affected vehicles will have a large impact on the way we travel. And I'm getting to stop, so before I stop, I'm gonna give a shameless pitch to our weekly newsletter that I've created uh, at our center at UC Berkeley. It's called Last Week in Innovative Mobility. 
Um, and if you're interested in you know, innovative mobility news, we send it out every week to your email and you can subscribe on our website. Um, so with that. How many people here took public transit to get to this meeting today? All right. How many of you carpooled? All right. We are more for carpool for car. Don't put your hands out there. That is, we are very, very aware. Thank you. Okay, so this question for our first question for our panel. Why isn't more emphasis placed on the whole public service aspect of mass transit? in the economic vibrancy of the entire community instead of just benefits. Okay, uh, Joel, you want to take this one on? It, it's a challenge that uh, I think, and please correct me later if I'm wrong, but I think what you mean is, is that, uh, well, my interpretation of that is public transportation really, even if you're not riding it, you're benefiting from it. Um, and we need to do a better job of selling that, that idea or that, that reality, I should say. Um, it's something that, that we're still, working on. I think that we're still kind of waking up from this infatuation that we've had over the car for so long in public transit for the most part. And I and I'm, I have to remember this all the time. We're, we're working on this bar fund measure, right? And I keep talking about how great art is and how we really need to make sure that we fund it and talk to bar riders. But even with as important as bar is, it's only just a small amount of rider, uh, people that ride it, relatively speaking. But everyone benefits from BART. When BART shuts down, we all feel it. And so we do have to do a better job of talking about the economic benefits, the climate, uh, the sustainability benefits, um, mobility, you know, the, the economic benefits of getting to a job and all that. It, it really does encompass everything, and we need to do a better job of, of saying that. Here's a question about Lyft and Uber, which addresses a different aspect, I think, of the social equity. Lyft and Uber currently hire drivers as self-employed. Um, driver, I read recently that drivers have filed a lawsuit to be treated as employees in order to receive benefits. And do you have any comments on that aspect? Yeah, well, it's really exciting to see the drivers begin to organize, and also even for the Google buses and, and those kind of things are also organizing. So that's an interesting change vector for reducing income inequality, and certainly. The private sector motivation is to drive wages down as low as possible, you know. It is a little bit sort of mean-spirited, so it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. But of course, like the, the Uber CEO says, you know, I can't wait to fire all my drivers so we can have robots driving around instead, because that'll make more money for me. So, um, so I think, you know, we all would be well served to uh, vote for Bernie Sanders and to create <laughs> And create a create an eco-socialist utopia where there's a guaranteed minimum income. Unfortunately, I'm concerned that that's not going to come about. Uh, I don't know. That was pretty close in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, uh, I would I would second that. But, uh, but yeah, no, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things with the with the equity piece going on with Uber and Lyft right now. I mean, the kind of Right now, you know, both, both players are really coming to the table with this. Uber is a little bit later to the game than Lyft is. Lyft has generally um, been there from early stages, kind of interacting with uh, communities, with local transit agencies. Um, but one one thing actually recently that, that, that made me think of that happened in the last couple of weeks, I think, is that um, Lyft settled a class action suit here in California. Um, and they they settled that they, they agreed to pay I think a, tens of millions of dollars maybe to a couple tens of thousands of drivers I forget the exact numbers um, but uh, essentially they, they they paid them out and all that they did was uh, they allowed them to know if they're if they're going to get get fired basically so they they paid them out and there really wasn't much that the Lyft drivers gained from that so there's these companies are huge, and they have a lot of money. Um, and unless the public side, you know, really pushes them and puts pressure on them to change, they're going to keep um, pushing forward. That's that's just what private companies do. So it's something that you know people in positions of power need to need to watch out for. Okay, Adam, I think we'll start with you on this because I think you addressed it a little bit. Um, my automated vehicles encourage waste or pollution by increasing the use of cars instead of people using mass transit and what's being done to prevent this? 
interesting. Uh, I, I don't know if anything's being done to prevent it yet, necessarily. Um, transit agencies could try to get these this technology when it first comes out. I think that would be fantastic, but I, I don't know if there's um, really any movement for it on this yet so far in the future. Um, but you know, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a main complaint of, of or that's a main concern of, of what these automated vehicles will do, um, you know, to people's travel behavior, to people's travel choices. Um, but I, you know, I think you know, with, with the with the mobility as a service model, um, you know, really, right now we're sort of in a in a two tiered travel market where you know you can choose you know a private automobile or you know maybe share it with a couple people, or you can choose you know mass transit like bar or bus. Um, and I think we're really moving into an era where we're going to start to move into an era where mobility is really a catered service. So there's right now we have these two ends, and I think increasingly we're going to see a lot of that filled in um, by a lot of different services. So I think you know how how much occupancy these vehicles have, who who knows? Um, but you know, it's people will always react to travel time and price point, and if the travel time and price points are there, if the occupancy is high. You know, people will take it, but again, a lot of it depends on how, how you know, how government regulators set up the rules. I think. Right. I would just second that there's a real public policy gap, and so that you want to demand from Senator Bell and MTC commissioners that they look into the deleterious impacts of some of these new technologies and come up with some ways to mitigate this stuff because it's coming pretty fast and. It's pretty obvious how some of these things are going to have impacts, and so it's kind of I kind of scratching my head why public policy isn't there, sort of thinking about it. So the next question kind of ties in a little bit with that. Um, it also has to do with car use. When we have faster moving traffic, a carpool lane went from three people to two. So, you know, it's interesting, the California Transportation Plan 2040 vision, which is saying there's a big shift away from driving alone to transit and so forth. So it's really thinking about increasing the occupancy of that diamond lane, cranking it up to four people so you've got buses and vans and you know, it's a Nissan Leaf with four people in it driving along and, and, re and having that work efficiently but be a little faster than the general purpose lane. So uh, the state adopted policy in Alternative 3 is really the other way, it is really trying to drive up occupancy and efficiency of the system. I'll, I'll just uh, say that Transform uh, and our website, shameless plug, We've all got newsletters, man. <laughs> Transformca.org, if you don't know it. Um, uh, we've been working on this concept of high occupancy car lanes and making sure that we do everything to get those uh, carpool lanes and high occupancy lanes moving as quickly as possible. The hope would be that if people aren't, and this is something that I know there's a lot of conversation around right now, and we hope to continue this conversation because it offers tremendous potential. But instead of building new lanes and widening freeways, and even if they're new carpool lanes, we could convert an existing lane and move the same amount of people as the three lanes next to it in one lane. And at the same time, if we can, if people want to pay to use the lane, they could pay for it, but then all of those revenues, instead of paying for the construction of that lane, could go towards paying for buses and transit that could also use the lane and make it available for everyone else that's doing the right thing. So, it's something that we're looking into that I know MTC has been looking into and is supportive of, but again, it's a concept that's going to take a while to, uh, to, to settle in. We're working on it. Can I add one more thing? Um, there's a scary upcoming tension between the climate and traffic congestion in that um, a electric vehicle with one person in them in the HOV4 lane is not really a great idea for congestion reduction. and so. You, you'd sort of like to still advantage electric vehicles, but not quite to that extent. So maybe it forces it to be a two-person or three-person carpool to get into the HOV4 lane. But just think about how we're going to upset the EV owners a lot, if, just by even just like mentioning that. <laughs> right. Okay, our next question also has to do with congestion. Would anything like London's congestion charge in the inner city work anywhere in the Bay Area of major cities? 
uh, it's something that we thought about a lot and we were very supportive of. Um, it's something that maybe we ought to do around the city of Piedmont so Oakland can get all these congestion fees of every car that leaves Piedmont. <laughs> Any Piedmont residents? Sorry, you know it's true. Um, no, but realistically, the, uh, the, to cross the bridge is effectively like a congestion fee. Um, you know, you're going into San Francisco um, in any of those bridges, and it's, a, it's something that works. It raises revenues, um, and there's talk now afoot of a regional measure three where we can really um, generate revenues. Um, of course, um, you reward people for, for carpooling, and so the cost would be lower for carpools, but if you're going to insist on driving by yourself, you're going to pay, and then that money, that revenue is going to go towards decreasing congestion. This thing has been so successful in the city of London that they've actually expanded it. The community has been calling to expand it because it's raising so much money for transit. It's really working very well. Um, it's, in, it's incredibly difficult politically. Um, you know, a lot of folks, especially if we start talking about doing it like in downtown San Francisco where there is congestion and there is demand. Um, and it's something that I think that we really do need to do because you know, we do have these TNC cars or, uh, uh, on rideshare networks like Uber and Lyft, where we've got drivers that are coming from Antioch that are driving around downtown San Francisco looking for, looking for rides, looking for fares. And, you know, because it's a job. And, and if there is no regulation, you know, with taxis, they're regulated. We know exactly how many taxis are on the street at any one time. These car companies that Lyft and Uber are very reluctant. In fact, they haven't shared the data that would allow for us to better regulate how many there are. So as we get driverless vehicles in, on our streets and or Uber or Lyft, and all these cars are driving around looking for revenues, we are going to need to do something like this. And it's going to be politically challenging, but it's the, I, I don't know how else we can, how else cities can regulate their streets. Because right now, this, these cities, they can't, they can't regulate the, the TNCs because it's a, it's a statewide jurisdiction. And so um, the only way that a city could regulate how much traffic is being generated by either driverless vehicles or these TNCs is by we creating these congestion fees or coordinating, as they call it. But it is very, very unpopular, particularly with employers and the businesses um, and, and the folks that are trying to, uh, that depend on traffic. The, the uh, transportation network companies, which are the Uber, the Lyft, all these other different uh, cars that are not taxis, but are sort of like taxis. Um, so the commute mode share into downtown San Francisco is 9% SOV, right? So it's super not auto-centered at all, <laughs> still congested. So uh, it's, you know, a little bit dodgy to add a congestion charge there. Can you really knock that down to 8.9% SOV? I mean, what's the, what's the bang for that? I, I think what would be interesting from a not viable policy standpoint would be to lasso all the major, like there's like 18 major uh, suburban office parks in the Bay Area with about 30,000 jobs in Bishop's Branch, Hacienda, and all this stuff in Silicon Valley. And like a $5 a day court charge would just be terrific in terms of congestion reduction. And it's so not viable, it's not even worth talking about. Not yet. <laughs> okay, uh, last question, I think. Uh, maybe some of you could address a little bit more the, the middle of that spectrum. Adam, you mentioned it, and I know Steve did. The middle of the spectrum between um, the individual vehicles, the, whether they're self-driving or talking to each other, and mass transit for lower income communities where maybe they're not that close to transit or they need some other types of transportation. We know that our vehicle fleet ages less rapidly as our cars become more durable. So there will be a considerable period of time in which many people will not have access to those newer vehicles with the new capacities. How do they take the best advantage of what we have coming forward? Right, well, um, I'm, I'm not going to speak to that, to the last part, but uh, I think to the first part I can kind of cover the sort of the, the middle spectrum of what, you know, the mobility services are that exist between traditional public transit and maybe say a TNC like Uber or Lyft. So there's a field called uh, microtransit is what it's kind of being called right now, and there's, right now there's three operators in the U.S. that are kind of like 
a, a mix between um, Uber and a van pool. So think, you know, on-demand shared Uber, like Uber Pool, um, but in a 15-seater van. So there's a company called Bridge, and Steve had mentioned some of this, there's a company called Bridge in Boston and Washington, D.C. now um, that tries to do this concept. There's one called Via in New York City and now Chicago, and there's one here in, 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 in San Francisco called uh, Chariot that is actually more of a fixed line service. But we're already seeing a lot of these services um, kind of emerge. And a lot of them, unlike the Ubers and the Lyfts, are, seem to be a lot more publicly involved. They use bigger vehicles, they use more street space um, to you know, drop off and pick up passengers. And um, you know, I, I know for certain that you know, these companies, and there was one of them actually that failed, was Leap Transit uh, in San Francisco. If any of you guys heard about them, there were this posh, uh, you know, same concept as there was this posh you know, bus that they actually bought all these buses, ripped out the, like, the um, you know uh, disabled accessible ramps to them, um, and serve like you know charge six dollar rides and serve like seven dollar you know smoothies in it um, to get from the marina to downtown San Francisco, right? Um, and they got shut down um, you know by the city in you know I mean there there were all kinds of issues with that, but it, it's really showing that these services can't um, necessarily survive the way that pushing forward and ignoring regulations the way that Uber has done in the past. You know, there's really this, um, you know, they, they have a much bigger, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, participation with the public sector. So I think that there's, there's, I think there's good hope that, you know, they, they could be incentivized, uh, maybe subsidized in ways to go into some of these communities of need and offer their more technology-enabled services. Because right now, paratransit, Costs way too much for you know for these agencies to run. A lot of times, it costs twenty or more dollars per ride. That's unsustainable, um, and that the subsidies have to be through the roof for that. So a lot of these services, you know, could potentially team with these municipalities to really drive that cost point down and, and really partner. Yeah, that that last mile solution, Director Peoples, I'm sure can talk all about how challenging it is to get good transit service out to places where you know the density isn't there. Um, to support um, a frequent service or you know, a fast service. Um, and so there is tremendous opportunity for some potential uh, cooperation, if you will, with getting that last mile um, uh, addressed. Like if you're coming in from BART, you know, and you're trying to get that last mile home, and that bus, you know, stopped running at six o'clock because it's a Sunday, um, you know, that these kinds of things are, are, are really areas of potential cooperation that I certainly hope we can figure out and then leverage because yeah, paratransit service in and of itself right now is it, it's it's the it's the bank breaker. I mean, it, it's so expensive to deliver that service, um, but it's a necessity. We need it, and there's a growing need for it. Um, three potential technologies and solutions. Um, electric bikes for eight mile trips back and forth as the cost goes down. I think those are really interesting for a lot of different people. There's this app, there's this version of Scooby, do we do, okay. <laughs> electric bikes for eight mile trips and um, uh, this Lyft driver destination where I'm an employee and I'm commuting in on an arterial like San Pablo or El Camino and I offer to pick up strangers along the way from people who are ending up kind of a similar place than me. So that's much lower cost than something with a professional driver. And then third is, you know, a typical public transit 50 passenger bus costs about a dollar per passenger mile, which loses money, you know, right and left. And Unfortunately, when we can eliminate the driver and create robotic vans with 10 or 15 people, then, and that may be able to run at 15, at 25 cents per passenger mile, so public transit could run at a profit, so we can really scale up public transit and then squirt some new service into places that are poorly served. So there's a lot of potential for that as well in the long run. Great, well I want to thank the panel for joining us and giving us their